Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, RFK Refugees podcast. Ted here, John is here, and we are joined by a very, very special guest, uh, the man who's going to lead us into the future of DC United, Mr. Hernan Lasada. Hernan, how are you doing, my friend? Thanks. Uh, I'm doing I'm really tired. Thanks for the for the chat. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so uh, let's 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 jump right into it. How how's your week been going? Uh, I know you 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 made the rounds on uh, several different uh, official MLS uh, media types, and uh, you had kind of just gotten the job and uh, couldn't couldn't really say much. But uh, how, how's your week been going? What what have you been? How you been keeping yourself uh, busy? I guess all the way in Belgium right now. Well, uh, a lot of paperwork uh, to get ready uh, here in Belgium. Uh, after 15 years living in Europe, you can imagine you have a lot of crap need to to throw away and 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 put a lot of things in in, in boxes and and try to fix everything uh, to make sure that when I leave. Uh, um, I, everything is settled over here, and in the, in the meantime, we are waiting for for the paperwork for the visa. So uh, I try to catch up a bit of uh, all the games of DC last season, games of opposition, trying to learn uh, as much as I can from from my squad, from my roster, my players, and and the moment we we meet, uh, I already have a, a clear view about the team and about the competition. Well, I'm, I'm I'm sorry you have to watch games from from last season. Uh, it was not the, the the back half is much better than the front half. I don't know how far you've made it in there yet, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. Oh, I even I even watched games of two seasons ago with uh, Acosta with Rooney. Uh, you you had a period that the defense was very solid, a lot of clean sheets. Uh, so I also been watching games from from two t- seasons ago. And from every game, every game you can learn something. Uh, different systems, players who play in different positions. So, was good. Was good to catch up and and see and see many games. That's good. I, I think that <laughs> there is definitely times. There's good times from all of those years. You can put them together. If you put the good, the good from both parts of the season into one, we've got we've got something cooking. Um, sort of uh, leading off that, there's been a lot of speculations about preferred formations. I know that when, when you got hired, a lot of us were scouring the internet very, very uh, urgently trying to figure out sort of, you know, you know, what, 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 uh, you know, what your tactical reputation is, what your formational preferences are. And a lot of DC United fans are very interested in tactics and philosophy. Um, would you say that you like to fit the pieces that you have into your conception of the way that you'd like to play? Or do you look at what you have available and then say this is the best. This is the best way forward with what I have. What's your What's your approach? Yeah, I think you mentioned as last. Um, if you are a coach with a fixed system with fixed ideas, and you arrive to a squad, not or, or not much in the way you want to play, then you don't want to succeed. So I think that the modern coach needs to adapt to the profile of players you have available at that moment and. And that's why a coach be prepared to train and to work in different systems and 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 learn what's the best for the squad or, or the roster you have at that moment. Um, I'm gonna give you an example. When I took over in, in Belgium, when I took over the first team, um, I didn't find that the team has the, the potential to play with with a back four because the fullbacks were. Uh, on one-on-one situations, so we needed to play with a back three, uh, with fullbacks who are a little bit more um, yeah, concerning and, and a little bit more offensive. Um, and and then later we did a preparation season and we started the competition in in first division. Uh, I started to play also many games with back four, so. Uh, I don't have a preference system. Uh, it's up to me to find what's the best system for the have right now at DC United. Talk a little bit, I guess. Uh, you, you're obviously uh, a young, uh, uh, a young coach. I believe you're the youngest in the league, if not one of, one of the youngest uh, coming into the league this year. Uh, talk a little bit, sort of, about maybe that adjustment period. What, what, what maybe surprised you, um, sort of adjusting 
uh, from from being a player on the field to, to sort of behind the benches. Uh, other than you can't, you know, strap on your boots and go out there. If, if you see something bad, go fix it. <laughs> fix it. <laughs> I, I have to say, um, I in, by moments, and definitely the moments that it goes well with the team, I enjoy a lot more the coach than being a player. Uh, when you are a coach and you are on the, on the bench and everything what's happening, um, it's like you plan, like you train, like you expect it. Yeah, you get that that type of adrenaline that is is amazing to feel. And and as said, of course, you are one of the team. You are you are one of the eleven players uh, on the pitch. You are one of the twenty twenty five players in in the squad. Uh, and the coach is 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 the leader. You have to to keep them together. You have to work a lot uh, on mental coaching. On uh, give attention to those players who who are not getting enough minutes. Uh, I mean, it's it's more a psychological work, and and I, I love that. I love that. I've been reading a lot, learning a lot from from a lot of trainers, and I have to say that coaching is is very exciting. And by moments, it's even more exciting than than being a player. That's good. I would I would always imagine there would be for me there would be a lot of frustration. I know for your your predecessor Ben Olsen, I imagine in the early years was very much considering putting him, naming himself to the substitutes <laughs> and just and just hopping on there when he could. Um, in a lot of the other interviews you had last week, you were talking about the attractiveness of MLS to you as a, de- as a destination. Uh, and that's sort of, that's an that's a interesting um, comment, all because I think that American fans have such a conflict in their own mind about what this league is. Like, what does this league want to be? Does it want to be one of the best in the world? Does it want to be a selling league? Where does it actually see itself? What are the things that you noticed from watching it from afar or from when you had, I think I read that you had a, a Yellow Van Damme was a, a, either a former teammate of yours or a friend. So you got to see sort of some of the environment. What about what you saw made it, made you think, A, I want to coach there someday. And then B, that this league is maybe better than its reputation on the continent. Well, first of all, the infrastructure and organization. Yeah, you have a, a country that has a, a culture for sport. Uh, you guys are very competitive since, since you are kids, since you are young, starting with the universities with, uh, at school. And that attracts me a lot, that, that uh, winning mentality um, and organization and infrastructure that you have been building on uh, the last couple of years, when you see the stadiums that many teams are now building, are not anymore the old ones where you are using for American football, baseball concerts. No, now every club is is building its own stadium. Uh, you don't see anymore all stars ending their careers in, at the MLS. You also see a lot of young talent, and that makes that the MLS now has also another speed. Uh, the speed of the game is, is much quicker and much higher than than years ago. So I really think that the MLS has potential I mean, in the short term also become one of the biggest competitions uh, in the world. Yeah. We like to hear that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we like to, uh, I want to talk a little bit, you, you highlighted, uh, I, I'm going to refer back to some of your previous interviews again. Uh, you highlighted some of our, our young players, uh, Moses Niven, Kevra Paredes, Griffin Yao, what other players have you, you know, you maybe had some time to watch some tape. Um, what, what player, other players have you maybe noticed and, and, and sort of, you know, say, you know, Hey, I, I think I can come here and I can get the best out of, out of them. Well, you mentioned that the young guys, they did it very well. Uh, 17, 18 years old uh, players like uh, Moses, uh, Kevin Paredes, um, that the moment, the, the minutes that they got, they, they did it very well. But I, I also believe that there were some players with big potential that came with some expectations and for many reasons, they, uh, they didn't perform the way they or even themselves expecting. And I'm talking about Edison Flores, about... Uh, uh, Yamil Asad about uh, all the, the forwards and uh, players playing up front who couldn't score uh, enough or, or not as much as they expected. So uh, I think I think there is potential to do better than what they have been doing the last season. Quick follow up there: you mentioned Yamil and you've been watching the games. 
Did you, what, what did you think about the experiment of putting Emil in the middle of the field for the last, uh, I think maybe five or six games. He's been traditionally a winger for this team. Um, I think last year he had very uneven performances. I think he would probably attest to that too, either by injury or r- probably rust after not playing for quite a long time. Um, but he had a, he had a turn playing in, in sort of a eight, in the eight position. And I think he did really well. Fans were really excited about that. I, I just wanted to know if you had noticed that sort of tactical change for him and, and if you had any general thoughts about it. Uh, yeah, I know him from Argentina. He used to be a winger, like you say, where he can make uh, his actions on, especially uh, those one one v one situations uh, against the line. Uh, but I also think he could be um, a creative, uh, creative, offensive midfield player that, with a little bit more of freedom, and closer to the 16 of the opponent. Uh, he could be dangerous. I saw those games that uh, you mentioned where he played more as a, a mix uh, controller slash offensive midfield player, more number eight position. He did it quite well, but I don't believe that's that's his best position. Uh, Yamil, he, he needs to play close to the 16 of the opponent where his actions could be dangerous um, and, and where you can create uh, scoring chances or, or give assists. Uh, the closer to the 16 of the opponent, uh, the better, I believe. Got it. Um, sort of following on the question, I think that this might relate, relate to the last question about the young players. Uh, in your conversations, both in the interview and then after with ownership, um, what do you feel like was the most important directive they gave you? Was it, we feel like we got to make the playoffs this year? I think that's probably an assumption, maybe, hopefully. Uh, we want to we want to get the best out of these young players. What was really what did you feel like? This is really what they they really want out of me. I had the feeling that mm, they were ready for a change, uh, for a new era, for for new principles, for a new idea. Uh, of course, they invest a lot of energy and, and efforts in the academy players. And with my experience working with the under twenty one in 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 Belgium and and working with young kids. And also I'm, I'm a kind of coach who give a lot of possibilities and, and opportunities to, to the young players. Uh, and I try to develop them the best possible way. That was one of the points, but actually about um, uh, challenges or, or a goal for, for this season, I think it's more kind of a process. Uh, the first year we know it's not going to be easy. Uh, it's, it's, it will be my first season. Um, uh, we need to be with, careful with budget and, and players. And so uh, I believe that the first season is going to be a kind of a, uh, a challenge season for all of us. But of course, we want to win more than just five games. We want to, 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 to achieve the playoff. Uh, and we will try to do that. But I, 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 I believe and I have the feeling that the first year is going to be probably an adaptation process year, uh, knowing exactly what we need for, for season number two and season number three. Yeah, I just want to follow up on that one, 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 one more thing. Uh, you mentioned sort of this year, I think we all understand sort of the, the budget environment. I think we would be crazy to not realize every single business and every single line of work is, is, is being hit that way. Did, do you feel like you, in, in the process of being understanding that this is a process, this is a multi-year uh, vision, do you feel like you have, not necessarily club assurances, I wouldn't want to get into that, those conversations, but do you feel well-supported going forward to, to do what you'd like to do beyond maybe sort of, um, you know, we, we're talking about budget this year, but going forward, do you feel like you're going to have the flexibility to add pieces that you want to add? Like I told you, um, I think for the first season it won't be easy. Uh, you know, also the financial situation of, of all the clubs all over the world, all, all the companies are, are having trouble due to less income than, than normal due to, to the pandemic. So you need to be careful. Uh, sometimes you need to be creative. You need to find solutions with, um, uh, with less budget. Um, Try to find uh, young guys or players who were doing not so well the last couple of years. But I, I insist, uh, if we bring something, and I hope we, we bring something for this first season, it has to be something that is going to make us better. It has to be better than what we already have. And, and otherwise, we, we need to manage to, to get better results with the, 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 the roster we already have. And, and I believe that's the point. 
possible. Uh, but doing crazy things or spending mil uh, on players that you don't even have the guarantee, yeah, I don't think that's the moment. So we need to, to build up. We need to, to take it easy. Uh, and first step, uh, try to get the best out of the roster we have. And I believe with two, three players on key positions, yeah, we can we can manage to fight for that for one spot uh, on, on playoff. All right, we're going to go to some of our questions we got from uh, our, our supporters over at Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash RFQ Refugees, if you would like to support the show. Uh, first question, uh, I'm going to get from uh, Matthew Doyle, uh, I think, on the lines. Uh, what do you think is your uh, best attribute as a coach? Positive. Positive is uh, even and mostly in difficult moments. Um, positive coaching when, when things are going wrong to – uh, to give that feeling to the players to, to keep on trying uh, never stop trying um, the moment you stop trying uh, the moment you give up uh, you give the chance to the opponent to win and when you miss, when you fail one or two or three times, go for the fourth one and go for the fifth one and, and that psychological point of view uh, to stay positive, to stay together in difficult moments, I think that's one of my biggest attributes we have, a, we have a number of questions about the captaincy, which is interesting to me. Uh, we've got Ar Arthur and Matthew Doyle have both, or I'll sort of try to summarize the general questions. Um, how important do you view that role in the team, both on the field and in the locker room? Uh, what kind of responsibilities do you normally assign that position? So how much, you know, are they, are they the go-between for you with the team? I, I feel like you're a young coach. You probably have a lot of conversations and, and, and relationships with the players. That's I probably, I would imagine that's important to you. So what do you, how do you view that role and uh, what, how important it is to the way that you run your teams? Captain is important. Uh, for me, captain is a lot more than, than wearing a band uh, around your, your left or, or right arm. Uh, you need to, to show and be an example for, for the group. Uh, and also you need to represent the group uh, by giving the example. Um, and I believe you, you need, as a coach, more than one captain. You need four, five, six captains. The, the more captains you have, the, the easier that it will be for, for any coach. And um, we have a few good personalities uh, in the team. I've been talking already with, uh, with many players and, and based on experience, based on, on time spent at the club, based on games, but also based on personality, uh, dare to share your feelings, your ideas, and most of all, represent the group uh, with your example. Um, I think those are the qualities you need to become a captain. Uh, we got another question from, uh, from Jeffrey Cook. Uh, what expectations uh, have, you set f uh, have you set for yourself for, for, this, for this year or for just for, just for taking this job? Um, expectation number one is to have an identity um, that we all know when you are watching this United, what kind of game we are playing uh, what was the plan, what are we doing what are we doing when we have the ball and what are we doing when we don't have the ball uh, for a neutral supporter you, you put the TV on and you watch this United, you know what kind of team we are I think that's, that's the challenge number one, to, to find the right identity for this roster. Aaron, it's like you were listening to our podcast a couple weeks ago. That's a, that's a, <laughs> that's a, that's a verbatim thing. I think we've been asking for, for about a year is that, is that, so that's wonderful to hear. Um, we've got more questions here uh, from Colin, Colin Ritchie. Uh, would love to hear your thoughts on the similarities between uh, DC United and, and <laughs> Biersch, Biersch, uh, we, we, we haven't had a belt. We had a, we had a Flemish. How close was I? <laughs> we, we had we had a Flemish. We had some Flemish lessons on our last podcast. They clearly did not stick. Um, but as far as similarities between sort of the youth setup, and obviously you're you're learning a lot of this stuff still. But sort of budget, the club ethos, how, how what the community tie is to the team, and then uh, sort of on top of that, what are the some of the things you're looking to bring from there to here? Some of the things that you really think are special about that club that you would want to you would want to make DC United replicate. I would like to bring my 
my European mentality um, based on, on, on discipline, on structure, on working hard or being together, respect the rules, respect the, um, the policy and everything what we're going to decide to do together. Um, here in Europe, uh, uh, especially, especially in, in, in Netherlands, in Germany, in Belgium, uh, discipline is, is very important um, on the field and outside the field. And a bit comparisons between Berscott and DC United, uh, uh, very fanatic supporters, um, especially at home. Uh, yeah, you feel you feel the support. You feel uh, a great atmosphere. Um, so trying to be hard to beat at home. We need to make a fortress out of our uh, home games. And for the rest, uh, not many similarities uh, um, related to infrastructure organization Belscott was seven years ago in fifth division they were bankrupt and they managed in seven years to come back to first division so um, from the point of view of uh, um, organization and, and stadium and, and facilities uh, there there is there is a war of, of difference uh, and if you can get to, if yeah. you can get someone to sneak you into RFK stadium uh, get get a, get a sort of secret tour and see what they were working with the last couple of years before they moved there. You might <laughs> there might be there might be a little bit of similarities. It's a lo- I just saw it. raccoons. I saw it. I really saw it. <laughs> Sorry, but, go, just didn't mean to interrupt. I, 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 no, I'm, I I already saw the facilities. I know they are they are quite old, but I know the club is working on on, on the new facilities and the new complex. Uh, hopefully, this summer will be will be ready. And the stadium is, is fantastic. The stadium is, is, is really amazing. I, I can't wait to play in that stadium uh, full, full of supporters. One sort of, I had one question that sort of ties to that. Have you thought about where you want to live yet? There's with the facility. So we just, today was the news about the Loudon breaking ground out in Loudon. And I don't know, I don't know what traffic was like in Antwerp, but uh, this will be worse. Whatever, <laughs> whatever it was like, I can promise you this will be worse. So have you have you been thinking about if you want to be closer to where the training facility is, and you'll be spending more days, or closer to the to the city where it's a little bit more, a little bit more going on? Uh, without thinking too much, I would like to live closer to the city and closer to the stadium. And if I need to, to drive or to spend more time on the road, uh, I think I will do it. But I'm, I'm a kind of coach who, and I already did it many times, a lot of times. If I need to sleep uh, at the Luton and at the new complex, I, I will sleep over there. And, and I will spend a few, t- a few nights there to avoid that traffic that, that you're talking about. We have a lot of time to listen to podcasts, and there are just so many good options for you to do that. So that's that's good. And, and picking picking DC is a good a good option because you'd be the neutral option. I, I, there is a Virginia Maryland inner rivalry uh, between between the the fan base of whether Virginia is better live. You got two Virginia guys here, so picking picking DC is a good choice because you're right in the middle. You can be neutral in the whole thing. So um, no, it, completely joking. Um, completely joking. Uh, Producer Brian has a quick question. Uh, you talk about the fan base. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've been, maybe you've been well aware. Uh, there's a huge uh, Latino connection uh, to the fan base, uh, but we. This is the first time we've had a coach from from the Central and South America. They've all been. Uh, we've had Bruce Arena, several other coaches, but they've all they've all been you know white Anglo Americans. What has it sort of been mean to you? Maybe that you are the first uh, you know La, uh, Latinx coach uh, at DC United. Sounds nice. Sounds uh, like a challenge for me to to represent uh, the best possible way all those uh, Latino fan base. I know there are a lot of uh, supporters, uh, Spanish-speaking supporters supporting DC United. I also have a lot of uh, Latino players uh, in our roster, in our team. And for me, after 15 years uh, speaking Dutch, French, and, and several other languages, it would be a pleasure for me to talk uh, English and to communicate in my mother language with all those supporters and those players uh, in my team. So, you, uh, 
Yeah, I think I think we're excited for that too. I think that as a as observers, it's always been it's always been interesting that as you watch sort of like Instagram and see how the players sort of break off into clicks, usually there's a language wall. And that's really what that's really what breaks it down. All the Spanish speaking players will hang out, they'll all be having a mate, they'll all be out having their own their own barbecues, and then the American players will be off doing something else. And the team over time has tried to like get the players Spanish uh, Spanish lessons so they can converse more freely. But it'll be really nice to have sort of a a central point that understands both camps and can, can communicate natively or or at least very fluently with with both of them. So I think I think that's only going to be good things for both team chemistry in the locker room and just maybe you know maybe hopefully performance too. Yeah, I, I believe I believe it. That's. That's something positive. I already felt that during my chats with with some of them, with some of the players, to have a coach who can communicate in in, in several languages. I can even speak, and I already spoke with uh, Frederic Briand in, in in French. And 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 the fact that the player can communicate and express express themselves uh, in in the la model language that's that's a huge advance for a player, but also for a coach. What, uh, one more question, Ted, from me. So what we're, we're, we're running now, we're, we're running up to the end of the, uh, of the interview, and we, again, appreciate you taking the time. Um, I wanted to talk about specifically this season. We've got, we've got some players that are coming back from injury, Bill Hamid, Steve Birnbaum, both recovering from, and that's the very central part of the spine for the team. Um, we we all, we've got all these new draft picks uh, signed. So the, there's a lot of – there's a lot of – there's some new faces. Uh, there's going to have to be, I, depending on when the season starts – some shuffling potentially about what, where you'd want to have your, your first choice 11. How do you feel going into, again, not knowing when the season's actually technically going to start because we still have to ratify the CBA and get all those things uh, sort of laid out before even getting a chance to work with the team. How do you, how do you feel? Do you feel optimistic? Do you feel like uh, you feel like it's going to ramp up a little bit as everyone comes back from injury and you get to sort of impart your philosophy or are you feeling generally pretty good? No, I feel good. I'm optimist. Uh, of course, it's not the best possible scenario when you have three, four important players. Uh, I hear about uh, Paredes, I hear about uh, um, Steven, about uh, Bill, um, about uh, Felipe. Uh, yeah, those are important players that won't be ready to start uh, pre-season. Um, so we need to be creative and we need to find some replacements on, on those positions. Uh, and, and that's that's a little bit our work together with Dave, with the people of the club, to to be creative. You know that this um, transfer window now, December, January, is it's quite complicated to find players who are ready and could give us an, an extra uh, window transfer during July, there are more possibilities, but of course, you are already three, four months or two, a couple of months already busy in the competition. And as a coach, you want to have your your squad and your roster uh, available from day one to to have a good a good preseason because that's the moment where you build up your principles and and you build up your team. But uh, okay, we will see. We will have a couple of meetings uh, next couple of days with Dave and and people of the club and. Uh, I'm positive. I'm positive. We will find um, some some solutions uh, with our um, budget to replace those those injuries or, or players who left uh, last season. We love this optimism. We we're, we're we we're an optimistic group. I think the I think the change comes at the right time for 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 the fans, for the club, for the players. So we're we're really excited to hear your your optimism and your hopes for the this year and, and the coming years. So absolutely. Ted. Yep. Uh, Ardan, thank you so, so much for joining us, my friend. We're going to let you get back. I'm sure, sure you got a lot of, a lot of things that you got to get, get to today, but thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we will, uh, we'll be looking forward to this year. Uh, we're, I think we're all very, very excited to have you on board. Thanks a lot. Uh, the same from, from my side, looking forward to meet you, to meet you all supporters, uh, people from the club. And, and I hope, and I wish, uh, supporters can come back uh, as quick as possible so we can have some some very nice and exciting home games with this United this season. Looking forward to having out of you rocking. Hernan, thank you so much for joining us. And, uh, yeah.